Hello. I was going to say thank you for having me in your home. But I thought about that a second time and I don't think that's appropriate because actually it's not me you welcome in into your home. It's the Spirit of God who will be present to you and to me and to all of us across the world as we seek to worship our Lord. So the other reason why it's not appropriate to say thanks for welcoming me into your home is because I think we're in the same place. I haven't arrived. Uh, I've arrived from a different physical place, but you and I are in the same place. And I think essentially we're here considering a reading from the Bible, from Paul's letters, because fundamentally you and me are asking this question, good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Today's reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14, all the way through to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So, I don't know what's happening today, Sunday, but for Ken and I here in the church on Tuesday, it's a fairly somber day because of what is happening around the country. And I just sort of had to get that off my mind to say to you that we recognize that as we reflect on the scripture. And you heard the reading from Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14. Another one of Paul's great amazing passages of teaching. And what I want to do is for you and I to simply go through this passage verse by verse from verse 16. Um, if there's a progression here. He starts off by saying, I pray, I pray that out of his glorious riches, Christ may strengthen you. That's his prayer. It's perfect for this time, is it not? It's, it's perfect for any time, really. I pray that out of his glorious riches, Christ may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that's verse 16. I just want to say this. I'm guilty, as I think you might be, but I'll speak for myself of tossing off prayers, of assuring, yes, I'll pray for you, or asking, will you pray for this person? This is happening, will you pray there? And I think it's just become too easy, too glib, really. When Paul says that he's going to pray that you and I are strengthened with power through the Spirit, he means prayer for us. And I know that this happened a long time ago in Ephesus, but the wonderful thing about Scripture is that it lives today. So what was real for Paul in his moment through the presence of God across all time, 
present to Paul as he was then, as he wrote, present to you and I as we consider these verses, it's applicable. And so when he says, I pray, he really means it. I want to just take you to um, a few verses at the beginning of 2 Corinthians. And this is what they say. Paul writing to the church in Corinth. We were under great pressure, great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. This is the great St. Paul far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. He was in prison in Ephesus when he wrote this. He was under threat of a death sentence. But he goes on and says more. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. Somebody says that to me today, or if I hear myself saying that to somebody, I would conclude there's quite a heavy depression, a heavy depression. So this is our St. Paul, and there isn't time to go through all that happened, but I will share a little bit with you uh, to bring him to this point of severe pressure to the point of depression and the fear of death and feeling like a, like a death in his heart. We, we would today say, I couldn't, I can't even get out of bed. It seems that's where Paul was. But then he says, but this happened. So he's writing in hindsight now. Uh, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who, after all, raised Jesus from the dead. Raises from the dead. So, so when Paul says, I'm going to pray for you, it's not glib. Because he has learned through the severest experiences, through the severest situations, that actually prayer is what gets us through and uh, not lightly. Listen to this. This is now a little bit further into uh, 2 Corinthians, where he just outlines the life that he lives and what it does to him. He says, this is uh, chapter 6 from verse 4, Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots. That's fairly topical. In hard work, in sleepless nights, in hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors. So, just to make the point that when Paul says he will pray for us, he's doing it out of the experience of what prayer can mean. It saved his life in a dingy prison in Ephesus. And he says that you may be strengthened where? With power, through the Spirit, where? In your inner being. That's really where we need to be strengthened, in the inner being. Because when the storms of life, as it was for Paul, as it is for us today, and your circumstances, mine, I don't know what yours are, but we know how the storms can rage around us and we wonder whether we will be overwhelmed. So Paul is saying, strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being, down below where the water's quiet, where everything is calm while the water rages above, in your inner being. That's where he wants us to be strengthened. So that... This is going into the next verse now. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. When he says Christ may dwell, he, the, the, the literal translation of that is pitch his tent. Pitch his tent in your heart. Uh, God deals in tents. Uh, if you have a look at the end of chapter 2, uh, Paul is saying, and we together are being formed into a tabernacle. Into a, into a temple 
where God himself dwells. And uh, David, remember when David, when, the, when, when they built now, not a tent anymore, but built out of cedar, a wonderful temple for God, a place like this, uh, God sent his prophet to say, really, really? David, do you propose to build a house for me to dwell in? And so through the ages, the Israelites, the people of God, the Christ followers got to know when we follow Jesus, it is about following. When he comes into our heart, he just pitches his tent and we need to be ready to move on. And by the way, one last thought on this verse. Uh, you can't pitch your tent in a storm. So that's why strengthened in your inner being, below the storms of life, strengthened in your inner being, and notice that the, the sentence continues, so that, so that Christ may dwell in, pitch his tent in your heart. He can't when we're up here in the storms, being overwhelmed. That's why Paul prays, in your inner being, in your inner being, may you be strengthened so that Christ may pitch his tent there. So now we're into the second part of verse 17. And Paul hasn't finished praying for us yet. <laughs> I'm so happy, are you? The prayer continues. You'll see this progression. You see, he started, I want to pray that you be strengthened. Now he's praying that from strengthening, he's taking us up a few steps towards heaven, really, or deep into where God meets us in the very center of our being, in our hearts. So he says, And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, so he's assuming we already know something about love. He's assuming that in our community, in your small group, as it is in mine, not perfect, but the one thing we do know there is that we're working hard to love each other in our small group. And it's not called Ephesians. It's, it has a few different names. I don't know what your, the name of your small group is. I'm assuming you're in one, and I'd encourage you to be in one if you're not. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the power, so that's an interesting word, may have the power to know, to grasp, the NIV says, if you'll see it on the screen, to grasp the length and breadth, the height and depth of the love of Christ. It's like he's saying, if you think you have a good idea of the experience of love, you don't know nothing yet. There's more to come. There's always more to come because there's no end to the love of God through Christ, by His Spirit, for us. It's really the most important lesson we can ever learn is to, or keep learning, is to know the love of Christ for us. It's uncompromising. There are no strings attached. The only string attached is that we're open to it, is that we welcome it, is that we want that love. So he says, I pray that you may go from the experiences of love that you know now, that you don't stop there, but that in your journey, in your following Christ, you may get to know of the height and depth, the length and breadth of the love of Christ. With all the saints, you see, there's your small group, <laughs> or your church, or whoever it is that you share your journey with. The call of Christ is always deeply personal, but it is never individual. We, he assumes that as with his disciples, we will be in a, in a discipling group. We will be in communication with people who keep holding us responsible and accountable for the journey we are on, that we don't lag behind, but that we continue with all the saints, that you may get to know the full extent of Christ's love with all the saints. It can't be individual, but deeply personal. With all the saints, that you get to know the full extent of Christ's love. 
So what is the full extent of Christ's love? Well, he goes on to say in the verse that follows, um, that love which surpasses all knowledge, which is to say that we will never get to know God, we will never get to experience God with our corpse cognitively only. It is not by science, it is not by thought, though these things are wonderful and supportive, but we know God by love. That's how we know God. And so this knowledge that is beyond every other way, usual way that we get to know things, that surpasses understanding, that surpasses, surpassing knowledge, is a knowledge derived not in the usual way of deriving knowledge. That is not discounted. Keep reading, keep learning, keep conversing, keep holding your traveling companion accountable. Ask, learn, reflect on your experience. But in the end, what we know is a gift and it's not something we possess. This is how I understand this knowledge that this, uh, which surpasses all knowledge. Knowledge is usually, I think of the knowledge I have that I got from university that I've picked up through the, all the books that I've read is something that, that I have. This knowledge is never something I have. This knowledge of the love of Christ is something that comes not, doesn't dwell, stay in me, but passes through me. It's between me and Ken, the cameraman now. Uh, so, this is an interesting verse. That you may know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. That you may know something that is beyond the usual way of knowing anything. And this is because Paul is talking about God, He's talking about love. He's saying that actually knowing the love of God is not something that we will ever derive, ever arrive at in the usual way of knowing anything. Which means that love that surpasses knowledge is not something I have. The knowledge that I have is the knowledge I've gained through my studies and my reading and so on and so forth, and I feel like I have this knowledge. It, but it's a static thing, and it's of limited use. But the knowledge that surpasses, the love that surpasses knowledge, therefore never gets trapped in me. It doesn't stay here. It's not a possession I have. The knowledge of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge is something that passes through me to you. It's always between us. It's never something that I have. And the only way to know it is to open our hearts, not to know, but to be known. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, now we know only in part, that's the knowledge we have, but then we shall know even as we are fully known. We cannot possess the being fully known. We can only avail ourselves to it. We can only open ourselves to be fully known by God. And that being fully known then is to know the love that surpasses the usual way of knowing. And it's not something I have, it's something between us. So I hope, friend, that you make time to be very still and very quiet and very open to be known by God. Know me, O oh God, search me, know my heart. I don't want to pretend to you. I don't want to hide anything from you. I want you to enter every nook and cranny of my being so that you being in me, I may know what cannot otherwise be known apart from the experience of love. And with that experience, be connected to God, for you and I to be connected even at this distance, I hope you can feel it, by the love that surpasses all knowledge. So when I came through the door at the beginning, 
and said I thought about an introduction of, well, thank you for welcoming me into your home. I do thank you for that, by the way. I hope that what we've shared here by the Spirit of God transcends users and transcends the technology and brings us heart to heart. I do hope that something like that has happened. But when I came through and said, um, I don't think it's appropriate to say thank you for welcoming me into your home, you did switch on your cell or your laptop or whatever it was and I came in and not Louise because we all remember to pray for Louise. I'm here because she's ill. I did say, actually, that's probably not appropriate because although I'm in a different place from you and we are being united by the camera, we're probably true to say we're essentially in the same place, you and I. The reason why we even considering these words of St. Paul is, indicates that we're in the same place. Something like the rich young ruler when he said to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Now in this, in these wonderful words of, of St. Paul, uh, remember there's this progression. He says, I want to pray for you that you be strengthened. And that you be strengthened, that was his first prayer, prayer to God for, for you and me, that we be strengthened in the inner being, below the storms of life, not buffeted, but below them at a depth with God that enables us to be in situations like we are in the country at the moment, to be in situations that come and threaten to overwhelm us, but we're not buffeted. We're calm, we're present because in our inner being is the Spirit of Jesus. And so his prayer, then the progression goes on, that Christ may dwell, pitch his moving tent, he's always moving on, we better be ready to move on with him, in our hearts through faith. And then he says, but now I want to even offer a greater prayer. I want to say that even though you might know a lot about love already, I pray that you may know the length and depth, the height and breadth of the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. We, we get very intelligent. There's a, there's a spirit, there's emotional intelligence, there's cognitive intelligence, but there's spiritual intelligence. There's a capacity to see what others do not see who do not have the indwelling Christ within them. That's what he's praying for, for us, that you may know beyond the usual way of knowing. And now, fasten your seatbelt, friend, for he ends. He's come to the great conclusion. He's taken us to the place that is like the pinnacle of this whole prayer. And you know what? It takes us back to our opening stance. Good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Paul says, so that you may be, listen to this, Let's not ever get too familiar with this, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I can't even imagine, but you and I have had a taste, I'm sure. A, t a taste to long for more, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I want to end with that silly story, you know, I mean, preachers love it, and I've used it, I don't know how many times, you might have heard me. But uh, you know how people talk about the eagle, hatching out in the chicken run. <laughs> and thinking, the great eagle, that he's a chicken. And scratching around with the rest of the chickens and looking and fighting over the grain that's there. And all the while, he could learn to soar like an eagle. It's just he's con got conditioned to saying, this is, this is all there is. Friend, in your walk with God, it's never, this is all there is. You know, I go to church, I read my Bible, I say my Bible. It's never all that is. May Paul's prayer for you and me take us onward to soar like an eagle out of the pathetic conditioning that our culture gives to us, telling us who we are, what we should long for, how we should be, who we should be, how we should speak, what we should own. Oh, 
my soul, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Paul's prayer for you and for me. And so we open ourselves in prayer. We open ourselves to receive, to receive the fruits of that prayer. Calm our mind, still our thoughts. So that we, so that we may open our hearts to the indwelling of you. Wonderful Father, Brother Jesus, beautiful Spirit, come in and know all about us. Know all about us that we may start to know more about you and live to that purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.